Grace Point, thank you so much for connecting with us today from your home. We have the privilege once again of worshiping and opening up God's word together. My name is Dan, and I'm one of the pastors here at Grace Point. And I just wanted to take a moment to welcome you, to thank you for joining us. If it's your first time connecting with us, thank you for clicking on this video. And we hope that in time, Grace Point can be a place that you call home. As each of us face this season of life, many of us are dealing with challenges. We're dealing with struggles and need. Some of you are watching this video today and on your shoulders is the heavy burden and weight of need. We want to help. It may be for some a financial need. It may be for others a prayer need. We invite you to share your needs with us by emailing prayer at gracepointefc.org. And as we receive those responses, we'll follow up with you to learn more. At Grace Point. We're seeking to live out Jesus' command, to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're seeking to love well. So let us know how we can encourage and support and love you today. Lastly, one of the things that each of us has is a story. And we want to hear your stories. We want to share your stories, our Grace Point stories. We've branded these stories as GP Stories. We hope that this week you've had the chance to hear stories of how God has transformed lives of folks right here at Grace Point. And we want to continue to share our GP stories. And so I have a challenge for you, for each of you. I'm calling it the hashtag GP stories challenge. And the question I want you to think about when you share your story is this. What is God teaching and showing you as you journey through this different chapter of life. As you face the various changes that have come over the past number of weeks, how is God working in your heart and life? And I challenge you to share your story with us. We're asking you to record your story on a, a phone or a tablet or a laptop, a one and a half to two minute video, and then send it to prayer at gracepointefc.org. One email address where you can share your needs and where you can share your stories. And as we receive responses, we'll sort all of it out. We look forward to sharing your stories of how God has been at work in your life, your stories of hope and life change. Church, we have the opportunity to shout to the world that despite all that we're dealing with, all that we're facing, we can have hope and joy. Thank you again for joining with us today. Let's worship together. Thank you.
Well, good morning, church. Uh, Worship team, thank you so much for leading us this morning. Let's pray as we open up the word this morning. Uh, Heavenly Father, I would just thank you for this opportunity to come around your word. Lord, we we have lifted our voices in praise and worship to you. Lord God, for you are worthy. You are worthy of it all. So now would you teach us in this moment, Lord, we, uh, we need a word from you. God, so would you speak to us now? We would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, church, would you open your Bibles, please, to 1 Kings chapter 17. Uh, 1 Kings 17 is where we're going to spend our time today. I'd like you to, uh, right there at home, let's get our Bibles open. I want you to see uh, see the word this morning. 1 Kings 17. All right, well, I'm, I'm excited to start a new series with you today. Uh, this new series is called Greater Than. And, uh, you know, I don't think I have to convince you that uh, these days, of coronavirus have been just kind of incredible and unusual times. And uh, I think it's important to point out that not everyone is walking through these days in the exact same way. There's really, you know, nothing that's cookie cutter about this for anyone. You know, for for some, uh, we are just incredibly overworked right now, incredibly busy. And then for others, uh, it really, uh, the pace of life has slowed significantly. You know, for some, uh, we really have no choice. We're very much out there in the community very much out and engaging with other people. For others, you know, uh, isolation is the norm. You know, for some, uh, we are still employed, right? Still still working and uh, earning the same income that we always have. But then on on top of that, some are even giving, getting a stimulus check. But then for others, uh, they're just out of work or unable to to work and the financial pressure is mounting daily. Uh, some people are are mad that restrictions are in place, and some people are mad that restrictions are being lifted. Uh, some are uh, feeling incredibly lonely, and then also others have had just uh, you know, way more than enough family time at this point. So we're not walking through this in the exact same way, you know. Regardless of our situation, regardless of our circumstance. In this new series, Greater Than, what we want to do is we want to get our focus on God. What we plan to do is we want to take a look. We want to focus in on a variety of examples from the Bible. Some people in the Bible who uh, really, they faced their own circumstances of trial. They faced their own circumstances of of loss and isolation and fear, um, uncertainty. You know, so as we uh, look at these various examples in the Bible over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to be reminded over and over again that we have a God who has shown us time and time again uh, that it is uh, both who he is, right, and what he has done. These things are greater, right, far greater than anything that we face today. So today we begin with community is greater than isolation. All right, community greater than isolation. This really is the story of Elijah, the story of Elijah. Now, the Old Testament prophet Elijah, he was just a mighty man of God. He was just a great prophet, really one of Israel's most famous heroes, but also he was a man just like us. Uh, He was familiar with both the thrill of victory in his life, and he was also very familiar with the agony of defeat. Uh, He knew times of great success, right? Fruitfulness in ministry, he also knew times of great peril, like just overwhelming fear and isolation and, and real discouragement in his life. Uh, for those of us who know, you know, life's not perfect, right? We're not perfect. Um, uh, and I think sometimes fear and uh, isolation and, and discouragement uh, 
even hopelessness, they, they can overwhelm us at times. I think for those of us who understand and know this, we're going to relate really well, I think, to Elijah today. This is his incredible story. All right, so we are, are first introduced to the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 17. Okay, again, I hope you opened your Bibles there. 1 Kings 17. Now, uh, in order for us to understand Elijah really and these next couple of chapters, I think we're really gonna have to understand a little bit of history. We don't wanna just throw our Bibles open and just dive into 1 Kings 17 uh, with no real perspective, no real context. And so what I'd like to do is give us a little bit of uh, historical perspective about what's happening right now uh, as Elijah comes on onto the scene in Israel, it's a very, very difficult time for the nation. Uh, So how did we get here? Uh, How did Israel get to be in such a difficult place? Well, for over a hundred years, Israel had uh, lived under the reign of three different kings. There was King Saul, uh, King David, and then King Solomon. And when Solomon came to the throne, uh, the people of Israel really had everything going for them, right? They had had wise and godly leadership. They had a great deal of unity uh, as a nation, and they had peace uh, from their enemies around them. But there's a very kind kind of short distance between triumph and disaster. And um, as time passed, really, I think King Solomon's um, success really began to breed complacency. Uh, this, This wise king, King Solomon, he started so well, but tragically he ended very, very poorly. His, um, his, virtually, I would say, unlimited wealth, his, uh, his incredible power, these things slid into excess for him. The scriptures tell us Solomon had 700 wives, right, and 300 concubines. Uh, hard to imagine, right? But this really was the root of his downfall. All of these wives, these wives were not just from Israel, they were wives from all the surrounding nations, um, and 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 4, gives us a little perspective. It says this, it says, When Solomon was old, his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not wholly true to the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Okay, well, what happened? Well, I think very simply what happened was Solomon did what was popular rather than what was right. What he began to do is Solomon began to build uh, places of worship for all of his wives and all of their foreign gods. Uh, By the end of Solomon's reign, right, the temple of the one true God in Jerusalem, it was literally surrounded by a smorgasbord of uh, shrines to other gods. You know, after Solomon's death, uh, the nation really quickly fell into division. The the nation quickly fell into war, uh, civil war, and Israel was split in two. There was Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Uh, The nation was was split over, um, over over the years. There were just a a series of kings reigning over both Israel in the north and a series of kings reigning over Judah in the south. And the tragic thing about the kings of Israel is that every single one of them, uh, all of them uh, completely rejected God. Uh, It was just one godless, uh, murdering idol worshiper after another, all of the kings of Israel. And, And King Ahab was just the worst of all of them, all right. King Ahab, uh, he he married the the lovely psychopath Jezebel. Okay, and between the two of them, this this sweet married couple brought Baal worship to Israel, and honestly, they made the Manson family look like Leave It to Beaver. Now, if you don't understand that reference, let, just to be clear, okay, it was bad. All right, it was really it was really bad. Uh, just. 50 to 60 years after the death of Solomon, Israel uh, had changed beyond recognition. At the beginning of Solomon's reign, right, the united nation of Israel said there is one God. There's one God in Israel. But by the time, uh, at, the, at the end of Solomon's reign, it was very much widely accepted that there are many gods, little g gods. And then by the time of King Ahab, uh, uh, by the time Ahab became the king over Israel, it was it was absolutely unacceptable to say that there is one true God and those who dared to say it, right? Those that would even dare to hold such a politically um, incorrect view, they were subject to persecution and they were subject to, to death, right? The people all assumed, right? By the time we get to King Ahab, the people all assumed that religion is basically, all religion is basically the same, right? And as long as you are sincere in your worship, right? As long as you were just simply sincere in your views, then it really didn't make much of a difference 
what you believed. Right? Does that kind of sound familiar to you? Uh, it sounds like us today, uh, our culture today. Like this is the culture in which, uh, this is the situation in which Elijah is called to take a stand, right? And to serve the Lord. Uh, God sends Elijah to King Ahab uh, to confront him with a very simple message. All right, let's pick it up. First Kings chapter 17, verse one. All right, are you there? Here it is. Uh, 1 Kings 17, 1 says, Elijah said to Ahab, um, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Okay, what's the message? Look, it's not gonna rain, King. It's not gonna rain unless I say so, right? Until I say so, not a drop. Like God is gonna bring drought and God's gonna bring famine. And he's doing this in order to get Israel's attention, right? His heart is that they would repent and that they would turn back to him. Uh, a little bit of a detail here, Baal, Baal is the uh, supposedly the God of the weather. So this is a little bit of an in your face moment here, right? It's not gonna rain uh, until God says so, right? All right, next, uh, the Lord sends Elijah into hiding for about three and a half years. All right, this long span of time goes by. For three years, Ahab uh, and his people have been searching for Elijah. They want to kill him, all right? And finally, uh, the Lord tells Elijah, all right, go back, right? Go back to Ahab because I am going to send rain. All right, let's pick it up. First Kings chapter 18 now. Okay, turn over one chapter. First Kings 18 verse 17. It says this, it says, when Ahab saw Elijah, uh, uh, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, no, no, I have not troubled Israel, but you have and your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, he who eat at Jezebel's table. All right. So in my, in my junior high, I remember going up um, in junior high at my school, if you wanted to fight with someone, if there, if there was going to be a big confrontation, uh, it was always the same. It was always the same. Like you couldn't throw down in the middle of the cafeteria, you'd get suspended. Right. And so if there was ever going to be a fight, it was always this, all right, meet me, meet me behind the tennis courts after school. The same thing always. So the word would spread like, oh man, Mike and Tim, they're going to fight behind the tennis courts after school. Uh, everybody would, would show up. They're like, There's going to be a fight. Now I think like Mount Carmel is, I would say just a classic, you know, meet me behind the tennis courts after school kind of moment in the Bible. Now there's going to be a showdown for sure. A, a confrontation behind the tennis courts on Mount Carmel is what's going on. Uh, and, uh, and what's on the line here, all right, what's on the line here really is true and authentic worship. True and authentic worship. How can Israel be restored? How can Israel return to worship the one true God? Right. How would God use Elijah you know, how can he, like this is 900 BC, right? How can he, and really think about it, like how can we today engage a spiritually confused culture that says, look, you've got your worship, right? I've got my worship. Uh, you've got your beliefs. I've got mine. I mean, who's to say you're right? And who's to say uh, you're wrong, right? This, this is the kind of idea that we live in today. Who's to say what's right? Now, who's to say what's wrong? Okay, first, if we're gonna return to true and authentic worship, uh, first we must focus on the truth. We gotta focus on truth. Look at verse, uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 20. It says this, So Ahab sent all the people of Israel and they gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is up on the northern part of Israel. Verse 21, it says, And Elijah came near and all, uh, to all the people and he said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, well then follow him. And the Bible says, and the people did not answer him a word. Okay, what's Elijah doing here? Well, he, he, appeals, to, he appeals to truth, right? The, the single uh, reason for worshiping the Lord is that he is God and there is no other. Right? He's worthy of our worship for this very reason. I mean, Christianity stands or falls on the simple claim that it's true. It's true. The, the, the question is simple and clear, right? If the Lord is God, well then follow him. And, and notice the response of the people. The response is the, the people said nothing, nothing. Uh, they, they didn't know what to say, 
right? They, they had been brought up on this lie that said, look, every person must find a way to worship that fits their own personal preference. See, when Elijah challenged them to decide what's true, they had no idea what to say. Now, he's setting just a great, I think, example for us to follow even today. Look, before you can worship, you must know who God is. Look, so so if worship is going to be restored, uh, truth must be proclaimed. You know, in our conversations with our family, in our conversations with our coworkers or um, our our friends or those at school, uh, we must really, I think, resist the the temptation to, to kind of conform to this false way of thinking. Right, which is, okay, well, you have your truth, right, and I have my truth. Uh, we we want to work against this, right? We must, I would say, graciously, like, press in on this issue of truth, right? Light cannot be dark, right, and dark cannot be uh, light. Uh, to lovingly, I would say, ask the hard questions, right? How can both of these things be true? Uh, what, what does that even mean? Now, Elijah is making them think, Right? Think, look, if the Lord is God, well, then follow him. But, but if Baal is God, well, then by all means, right, follow him. So Elijah presents a solution and I think a very, very um, a visible demonstration of the truth. His proposal is, okay, we're going to take two oxen. All right, you take an oxen, I will take one. Uh, you build an altar and sacrifice the oxen uh, to Baal. Um, I will build an altar and I will sacrifice an oxen to the Lord. And his, his proposal is, look, the God who answers uh, with fire from heaven, right? The God who drops fire from heaven down, uh, he is God, right? Whoever responds, he is God. And all the people, all the people said, man, that's a great idea. That is a great idea. So from morning till noon, the 450 prophets of Baal, uh, they dance around the altar and they call on Baal to answer them. All morning long, no answer at all from Baal. Now about noon, um, Elijah begins to talk uh, some trash. All right? He begins to talk trash to them. And you know, since sarcasm is my love language, this really ministers to my soul right here when I read this. Uh, Elijah, he begins to mock them, right? And he says to them, okay, well, well, maybe you need to yell a little bit louder. Like maybe your God is not uh, paying attention. Maybe he's busy. Elijah kind of says, maybe your God's going to the bathroom. Okay, it, it literally says that. Check that out, verse, uh, chapter 18, verse 27. He says, maybe your God's going to the bathroom. Uh, maybe he's asleep and you just need to wake him up. Uh, look, for, for another three hours, just in this frenzy, right? They, they dance around and they cut themselves, uh, trying to get Baal's attention, uh, trying to get Baal to respond with fire. But I would just say, like, understand this, y'all. Like, this worship This worship is, I'm sure, incredibly uh, sincere. I'm sure that this worship is probably quite meaningful, right, for the prophets of Baal. Verse 29, verse 29, it says this, uh, but there was no voice, no one answered, and no one paid attention. I mean, this really is the tragedy of false worship, isn't it? The tragedy of false worship is that there's no one there. There's no one there to pay attention. Uh, there, are, there are many people today who have concluded that really Christianity has evolved uh, basically in the same way as the worship of Baal evolved. Uh, they assume that the Bible is a book of ancient myths. The Bible is a book of... Um, of these myths, and because they assume the Bible is really a creation of human culture, they insist that the Bible has no authority. Uh, look, if, if all religions are basically just simply human creations, then, then it's true. None of them could claim to be ultimately true. Right? If they're all just simple human creations. But see, Elijah knows something. Elijah knows that the living God is not a cultural creation. Uh, Genuine worship, it can be restored when we first, we must focus on the truth. But then second, when we focus in on the living God, we focus on the living God. Uh, Elijah, he built this altar, right? He prepared his sacrifice. Uh, Elijah even had them uh, pour a bunch of water all over the altar just to make sure, okay, there's no tricks going on here, no tricks. And then Elijah begins to pray. This, This simple Prayer, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 36. Elijah prayed, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you 
our God in Israel and that I am your servant and that I have done all of these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord. Answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their hearts back. You know, I say the, the most fundamental truth in the Bible is this, it's in the beginning, God. In the beginning, God, right? He is the creator of all. You know, but I just tragically, the knowledge of God has been, has been drowned out, right? By the noise of thousands of other uh, man-made substitutes, right? Authentic worship is directed towards the living God. And, and Elijah prayed a simple prayer that the living God would make himself known to these people right there on top of Mount Carmel. Right on top of Mount Carmel. And I would, I would ask us just to think this morning, like who uh, in your life today, who do you know like they, they really need uh, this simple prayer? They need this simple prayer. Um, uh, God, will you please make yourself known to and you fill in the blank. Like who is that person that's in your life? It could be a family member. It could be someone that you work with, uh, a neighbor right down the street. Like, who is it in your life? And you know, man, they, man, they need this prayer. Uh, God, would you please uh, make yourself known to them? Like, open their eyes to see the truth. Um, I, I would just ask you, will you identify that person in your life? And will you begin to pray for them? Even today, would you start to pray? Yeah, it might be like, oh, pastor, I've been, I've been praying for that person for years. And I just want to encourage you, uh, continue. Like, keep that prayer this prayer of faith to say, God, would you open up the eyes to see? God, would you do what only you can do? And that is reveal yourself to them for they desperately need you. Uh, continue to pray. All right, so we're gonna focus on truth. All right, we're going to um, uh, focus on the living God. And, and then third, uh, focus on the sacrifice. Like focus on the sacrifice. The very next verse, verse 38, it says, then the fire of the Lord fell. The fire of the Lord fell. Now try to imagine that you were there on Mount Carmel that day. Uh, you're in that crowd and, and you've bought into the, uh, really the lie of your culture that says that all religions are basically the same and you just need to find what is best for you. Uh, you've followed after false gods and you've rejected, right? You've rebelled against the God of Israel. You've, re you've rebelled against the God of Elijah. And you've uh, listened to Elijah pray now. And then imagine, okay, suddenly, suddenly the sky is filled with fire. <laughs> okay, the sky is now is filled with fire. And in an, in an instant, right, in an instant, you uh, realize without a doubt, um, Elijah has been speaking the truth. Only Elijah has been speaking the truth. The Lord is God. And now the fire of his judgment is, is falling, Right? And it's going to fall on me, and it's going to fall on all of the rest of us. Uh, put yourself there that day. Like, this, is, this is not a um, oh goody fireworks moment. Right? There's nothing, oh, well, how pretty. This isn't an oh goody fireworks moment. This is an absolute moment of terror right, for all of those that are standing there on Mount Carmel. And verse 38, I think, is just the greatest part of this whole story. Verse 38, is, we see in this the awesome grace of of God. It, this, the fire, it says the fire of the Lord fell, but, but notice what it says. Okay, where did the fire of God fall? It doesn't fall on the people. It says the fire of God fell on the sacrifice. The fire of God fell on the sacrifice. Look, there were thousands of people there, but when the, when the fire of God fell, it did not fall on them. Right, God in his grace diverted the fire from them, which they deserved, right? And it fell and it focused on the sacrifice. Like on, I would say on another day, like on a different hill, um, another sacrifice was offered. Like when Jesus Christ, the son of God, went to the cross at Calvary, right? And, and the judgment of God fell, right? The, the penalty for sin, which is death, fell. And in God's great grace, it did not fall on me, which, which I deserve, um, it fell on my perfect substitute, the sacrifice, right? Jesus Christ. Uh, it is through faith in the work of Christ, his death and his resurrection, uh, we are forgiven. Like we are reconciled to God. The sacrifice of Jesus, you know, for sinners like us, it's, it's the focal point of Christian worship. Uh, authentic worship is restored when we focus on the truth, 
right? When we focus in on the living God and when we focus in on the gracious sacrifice that has been given for us. Look, look at the response of the people. Their, their response in verse 39, it says this, and when all the people saw, when all the people saw it, it says they fell on their faces and they said, like the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Like the living God was revealed on Mount Carmel. Uh, the victory, it was, it was great, right? Not one of those 450 prophets of Baal escaped the sword that day. Uh, Elijah was just a heroic prophet without a doubt. And as I said earlier, he, earlier, like he was a man of God who absolutely knew the thrill of victory. This is, this is absolutely the greatest uh, example of, of God-given victory through Elijah. But there's more to the story of Elijah than just that. Uh, he was a man just like us. Like he knew the agony of uh, also discouragement. He also knew the agony of um, isolation and fear. Uh, and on one occasion, it just overwhelmed him. It overwhelmed Elijah. Uh, as After we read about Elijah's confrontation on Mount Carmel in chapter 18, we, we turn the page and we read about the very opposite in the very next chapter. Incredible victory, chapter 18. Incredible defeat and discouragement in chapter 19. Uh, honestly, I'm so glad that the Lord gives us Chapter 19, uh, God doesn't leave this out. God doesn't ignore, uh, thankfully, the, the weakness and the struggles of people like Elijah, just people just like us. Uh, we get to see them really warts and all, which is really, really good, right? Because we can absolutely relate. We can relate. There are times for us, right, when isolation, times for us when fear, uh, discouragement, uh, hopelessness, it can overwhelm. It can overwhelm us. Uh, it can uh, come slowly over time. It can come uh, sometimes over just a period of, of weeks, like the pandemic that we're experiencing now. Uh, sometimes it can come with just one phone call or one text message. Uh, in, in Elijah's case, it was just one message from one messenger. Uh, check it out. 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1. Are you there? It says this. 19.1. Ahab told Jezebel, uh, that's his wife, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as one of them by this time tomorrow. In other words, in other words, man, may, may the gods kill me if I don't kill you by tomorrow. All right, this is uh, this is your last day to live, Elijah. All right, Jezebel is just ticked, right? She is coming after him with, with everything that she has. Now, uh, we, we would love, right? Okay, are you with me? Like we would love to um, uh, imagine that what's gonna come very, what next in verse three? We just read verse two. What's gonna come next in verse three? I think we would love it if verse three would say something like this. Well, when Elijah considered, okay, the power of the living God who drops fire from heaven, uh, compared to the annoying gnat, Jezebel, uh, he prayed. And he went about his business, trusting in God's mighty protection and God's sovereign will. Like that would be awesome, right? If verse three said that, right? We would kind of hope maybe it would, but no. Uh, verse three is realsville. Okay, verse three is real. Do you see it? It says this. It says, then he was afraid. Okay, that's his response, right? He was afraid. Uh, and he arose and he ran for his life. And he came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. And he left a servant there. Okay, where's Beersheba? Beersheba is that, well, Mount Carmel is up on the northern side of Israel. Uh, Beersheba is in the absolute southern part, about as far away as you can run, right? And then he, uh, he's not done. He, he goes to the, about as far as away as he can get. And then he keeps running some more after that. Verse four, it says, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and he sat down under a broom tree and he asked that he might die saying, it's enough, it's enough. Now, O Lord, take my life away for I am no better than my father's. I'm no better, right? What's he saying? What he's saying is, look, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not any better than all of those prophets who came before me, right? Uh, they all failed, uh, and I have failed. Jezebel wins. Baal worship continues. Come on, God, just take my life. He, he's done. He's done. Uh, overwhelming fear, right? Utterly uh, discouraged. 
So, uh, like, what is contributing to all of this? You know, how did we get here? Well, I think, number one, I think he's both phys physically and he's emotionally um, exhausted, right? Physically, emotionally exhausted, and he also he's completely isolated, right? He is, he's alone. Uh, he has completely separated himself from others. You know, what, I think when we get afraid... Uh, so often, like when we get overwhelmed, when we get incredibly discouraged, what we tend to do is we tend to withdraw from uh, strengthening relationships. And it's just absolutely one of the worst things that we can do. We just tend to isolate and withdraw. And I, I really think this is one of the one of the things that's been so difficult about all that we're facing right, uh, right now. You know, this social distancing has really led to emotional distancing uh, between us. And uh, in a time when we just need community, isolation is the order of the day. So this has just been particularly difficult for so many. And, and really in Elijah's case, what it did is it led him to a great deal of fear. Uh, it led him to a great deal of self Pity, you know, like I'm, I'm just, I'm no better than my fathers. And we got to ask the question, I mean, really? Really, Elijah? I mean, who told you that? Who told you that? Well, that's what Elijah told himself, right? This didn't come from God. All right, so he's feeding uh, these, these false thoughts into his, into his mind. Uh, do you see these things in your own life? You know, like, what do you know of this in your very own life when, when the pull of isolation and when the pull of fear and discouragement sweep in? I would just ask you this morning, like, what is your greatest struggle like, during this, during this stay-at-home time, right? this time of stay-at-home orders? Uh, we've been in this for weeks now, and, and we're, we're not sure where it's going to land yet. Um, I would say, like, what, is, what is your greatest struggle in these days? Uh, what have you been wrestling with the most? Right, consider this. Okay, like thankfully, uh, God met Elijah in just this darkest moment. Uh, God provided uh, and proved himself here in this moment to be greater, greater than all that Elijah faced. Uh, let, let's take a look at the sustaining grace of God as he enters in proves himself to be greater than all that Elijah is dealing with here. And I would say first we see the grace of rest, right? The grace of rest. First Kings chapter 19, uh, look at verse five. It says, and Elijah lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Uh, and he looked and behold, there was at his head uh, a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and he drank and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came and said a second time and touched him and said, Arise uh, and eat for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and he ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Okay, so I love these little verses here. Like, well, what did God do? Well, God enters in and God gives Elijah rest. He just simply gives him rest. You know, I don't, I don't, uh, I, I know this isn't really overly spiritual, right? But I think sometimes uh, God knows that exactly what we need is we need a nap and we need a snack, okay? We need a nap and we need a snack. It's that simple. It's that simple. You know, so I say, if you're like in, in, a, in a tough place like this, that might be the, that might be your cry. Look, I need a nap and I need a snack. Okay, and th here you go. It's it's in the Bible, y'all. Okay, right here, uh, God knows this is what He needs. But I mean, notice this too, right? There's no rebuke here. You, you see this? There's no rebuke. There, there's no sh there's no sermon for him. There's no shame uh, that God lays on him. God just says rest. God says eat. God says be refreshed. Uh, we, we live just on full tilt busy all the time, don't we? And we are constantly on the go. And, and if you're like me, you probably, right now, you probably have about 20 different sources telling you right now, like what to do during coronavirus, um, um, what to do, where to go, uh, how to act. Uh, you have so many different sources telling you, here's how to excel with homeschooling for your kids, and, and here's how to stay healthy, and here's what to think, and here's what to do. It's just coming at us uh, just, just constantly. And I would say, uh, this can overwhelm. It's like, do you have margin in your life for rest? Just for rest right now. Uh, God gives it to him. God gives him just this pause uh, for the grace of rest. God also gives Elijah the gift and the grace of his presence. 
his presence with him. So, you know, if you're, um, I would say, if you're struggling today with fear, if you're struggling today with dis- just discouragement and, and this overwhelming sense of even isolation today, I want you to see the heart of God here. He, he draws in close. He draws close to Elijah. He draws close to us in our time of need. Check it out. It's verse nine. Verse nine it says this. Then uh, he came to a cave and he lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to Elijah and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, God. They've thrown down your altars, God, and they have killed the prophets with the sword. I, I even, I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. So, so what's going on? He's utterly discouraged, right? He's isolated and he's alone. And again, notice it. There's no rebuke from the Lord here. Uh, there's no, um, just come on, snap out of it, man. There's no snap out of it. There's no shame. Instead, God, God draws in close to him. He wants to get Elijah's attention. God knows that we got to get Elijah's eyes off of himself, we got to get Elijah's eyes off of Jezebel, right? He's got to get his eyes on, focus back on the Lord. Verse 11, verse 11, uh, God said, go out and stand uh, on the mount before the Lord and behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind tore uh, the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. Okay, but look at this. It says, but the Lord uh, was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Now here it is, you see this? It says, and after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. A low whisper. Look at Elijah's lowest point. God draws near to him. And Elijah hears God just in the quiet of the whisper. You know, sometimes God does work in those kind of the big, those big and dramatic kind of earth, wind and fire kind of, kind of ways, right? Sometimes God moves in these things. Sometimes God just absolutely wipes out fear. Sometimes God absolutely changes outcomes. He dramatically heals. And sometimes God just dramatically protects or, or delivers, right? But sometimes he quietly ministers to us, quietly. Uh, he quietly speaks to us by the Holy Spirit, right? Bringing to us um, encouragement, just in the quiet, small whisper. Uh, Sometimes he brings us um, comfort or or guidance or peace in the midst of the storm. Like it's the grace, right? It is the grace of his presence that never fails. Uh, And Elijah hears it in the whisper in this moment. Um, I would say, is the Lord using this time that we're in right now? This time of, of coronavirus, is the Lord using this as time just simply to get your attention, just simply to get my attention. Uh, he's here, right? He's here with us, right? He's drawing close to you. I would ask, are you drawing close to him? Uh, are, you, uh, are you getting quiet before the Lord? Uh, maybe what we need to do is just simply turn off the social media. Maybe we need to turn off the news. Um, all of these these wind, fire, earthquake kind of things that's coming at us all the time. Maybe we just need to get this stuff off and we need to get into our Bible. We need to get our Bible open so that we can hear the Lord speak to us. Like, are you getting that time of rest? Are you getting that time of simple quiet before the Lord? Like we need to hear his voice, right? We need to hear his voice in the midst of all the noise. And then last, I would say there's the grace of community here, right? The grace of of community. Um, God asks Elijah, again, like, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And Elijah's response is the same, right? But, but this time, this time, the Lord sets Elijah back on course. He sets him back into a community. He says, Elijah, I want you out of your cave, right? And I want you back on mission. I've got work for you to do. Check it out, verse 15. Verse 15, it says, the Lord said to him, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. Right, it's, it's time to go. The Lord said, uh, when you get there, here's what you're gonna do, all right? Like self-quarantine, all right? Self-isolation time's over, okay? Enough of that. That's over. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go and you're gonna anoint two future kings, all right? That's your mission. You're gonna anoint two more kings. You're gonna anoint a new prophet. His name is gonna be Elisha, right? And uh, you're gonna serve, not alone, but you're gonna serve alongside of Elisha. Uh, he is eventually going to replace you, Elijah. 
Um, Elisha just proved to be an incredible um, encouragement, a true gift to Elijah. And, and not only that, in verse 18, the Lord reassured Elijah. The Lord reassures him, look, you're not alone, right? You're not alone in this. Uh, Verse 18, yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Again, look, you're not alone, Elijah, right? Have faith. Uh, Lord, get out of your cave. Get out of your cave, man. Uh, Get your eyes off Jezebel, right? And get your eyes off your circumstances, right? The message is look to me, look to me. And I I would ask again, are you feeling isolated? Are you feeling uh, overwhelmed, perhaps fearful, uh, even discouraged today? Uh, God gives us the grace of rest, the grace of rest. Uh, Psalm chapter 46, um, it was really the, the, first, um, the first Sunday that we were um, doing church from home. Uh, we turned our attention to Psalm 46 that Sunday. And in that Psalm is just that one beautiful verse that just simply says this, um, be still right? And know that I am God. God is our refuge and strength, right? And the highlight of that Psalm, Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. Now God gives us this grace of rest in the midst of the storm. Uh, God also gives us the grace of his presence, his presence. Uh, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us, right? So we draw near to him. Uh, he hasn't left us. Uh, he's always there. Like, will we turn to him. We know the grace of his presence with us when we get quiet before him and he speaks to us, right? Even in the whisper. And God gives us the grace of community. Community. Uh, Now more than ever. Now more than ever here at Grace Point, we want to uh, connect with you. And now more than ever, we wanna help you connect with others. Uh, today, if you're feeling this sense of isolation, you know, perhaps you've not yet engaged in a, uh, one of our life groups, uh, one, some of these other groups that we have in order to really stay connected during these days, I just wanna encourage you, please take advantage of this. If you'll go to our, uh, our website, right there on the front page, we have a, a link to some various ways that we can help you get engaged get connected with others in some of these online groups. Uh, Now's the time for this, like the gift of community. You know, at the, uh, I just wanna also invite you, at the end of the service uh, today, we're gonna have a couple of questions for you uh, to reflect on and some questions for you to discuss at home. Uh, you'll, you'll see them on your screen. So I just wanna invite you, please take a minute, right, and, uh, and do that, either on your own or if you're with, your, with others, you know, do it as a family together. Uh, take the time to reflect on these questions and discuss them together. Like, let's take what we're hearing today and let's put uh, some real uh, legs to it. Like, let's have some specific intentional plans for how to carry this forward uh, together. All right, so praise God, right? Praise God in the midst of all of this. Like, he is the living and he is the true God. He meets us in our point of need uh, and he is absolutely greater than all that we will face. Amen. Uh, Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, God, we this morning uh, praise and celebrate you. God, you have shown yourself you are the true and the living God. God, you uh, work and move in this world in power. And so, Lord, we would ask for your grace in our lives uh, this morning. Uh, so many of us, we are knowing these, this feel of isolation, uh, this real, real sense of uh, of discouragement, uh, perhaps even for some, uh, some significant fear during these days. But God, we have no reason to fear. God, for you are with us. God, would you give us this grace of rest. God, would you give us uh, the, uh, just the clear, true sense of your presence as you speak to us through the word and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then God, would you build within us a greater and greater sense of community, um, the people of God loving and serving one another. Lord God, you are with us, Lord, and we are with one another, the body of Christ. So unite us together as one. God, would you do this good work in us and through us, we would pray. Thank you for this story, this example of Elijah's life. God, may we see, God, the true and living God, God, who is with us. God, greater than all that we would ever face. God, we praise you and we worship you today in Jesus' name. Amen.
by sing forever a holy God come and worship the holy God what are the glory like fire, what are the power to raise the dead? What are the name of names they be feared? Only a holy God. God.
Worship team, thank you again for leading us. Uh, praise God. He's so worthy of our praise. Church, we're praying for you and uh, so looking forward to the day when we're coming together. Let's continue to encourage and support one another. Let's continue to minister to the needs right here in our own community around us. So I just want to close this morning with a word of benediction and now go into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Honor all men. Uh, strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering and share the gospel. Love and serve the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. God bless you.